Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be here representing the Society of Integrative Oncology. I'm going to give uh, one minute just to make sure people can start logging in, make sure some computers might be a little slower, just make sure everyone trickles in. So I'll start in about 30 seconds. Well, greetings. Um, so my name is Dr. Eugene On. I'm a medical oncologist. I practice breast cancer and cancer treatment centers of Chicago. And it's an honor to be representing the Society of Integrative Oncology and to be with you to talk about the vitamin D story uh, and what COVID-19 has to say about the importance of vitamin D in human wellness. 2020 was a tough year for all of us. Um, and to make things worse in this country, we had misinformation uh, motivated by politics and economics really to distract people from the real conflict going on in this country, which is profits and power over people. So using narratives like Antifa to have half the country fearful of advocates of peaceful change and narratives like religion versus science to encourage people to ignore science are all false narratives. These are false narratives, but designed to divide this country into two. So I had to watch my loved ones from afar suffer, just like many others in this country. It was ex extremely difficult, emotionally traumatizing. And the only solution from my perspective and from SIO's perspective is to look at the science of the situation. Um, we have to set it is what it is um, and distill some core truths about human wellness and empower people to pursue that on their own. So that's the purpose of this presentation. Potential conflicts of interest, uh, CTC is a for-profit hospital, but according to this um, slide, I'm actually supposedly more susceptible to underreporting the benefits of vitamin D since vitamin D already has good evidence for risk reduction of breast cancer and colon cancer. And, uh, and likewise, this will lead to less profit for cancer centers. So if you believe that, I think you'll be very shocked by the conclusions of this presentation. So objectives, um, we want to review the mechanisms of vitamin D absorption, production and activation, review the evidence regarding the potential importance of vitamin D and prevention of serious illness with COVID-19. And for the most part, I'll be excluding preprint pre -print papers without peer review. And we'll conclude the session with a Q&A. By the way, for the Q&A, if you have a question, um, there's a Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Please use that for your questions. Don't use comments, but we will review the comments and try to capture some if some are sent there, but please use the Q&A if you wanna ask any questions. And we'll go over those all at the end of the presentation. So a little background on the Society of Integrative Oncology. It's an international organization of oncologists, oncology care providers, administrators, and patient advocates who are all committed to and appreciative of the importance of medical research and advancing new standards of cancer care. This organization is very dear to my heart and I believe will serve as a beacon of trust and truth as medicine shifts to becoming truly patient-centered. And I welcome any of you viewing this to check out our new website and I'll have the link at the end of this presentation. But the definition of integrative oncology for those not familiar with this term is that integrative oncology is a patient-centered evidence-informed field of cancer care that utilizes mind and body practices, natural products, and or lifestyle modifications from different traditions alongside conventional cancer treatments. Integrative oncology aims to optimize the health, quality of life and clinical outcomes across cancer outcomes, across the cancer care continuum and to empower people to prevent cancer and become active participants before, during and beyond cancer treatment. But the key message here is we use evidence informed decision-making and I'll go into that on my next slide and our goal is to empower people rather than having a central repository of information that's really known by an authoritative figure at the top of the pyramid. What we wanna do is really dispense and share and help people understand the scientific literature so they can make their own decisions. So these are um, generally, this is the approach to the conventional medicine side versus the integrative side. They're not opposing viewpoints. In fact, integrative medicine is really an encompassing umbrella of conventional medicine with the evidence-informed medicine. So conventional medicine, to illustrate to you what conventional medicine and that mindset is like, in March of 2020, when the pandemic of COVID-19 came across our borders, Dr. Anthony Fauci correctly stated that there is no randomized controlled trial showing anything can cure COVID-19. Dr. Fauci is our physician scientist leader for this country, 
and he correctly summarized the state of evidence um, regarding COVID-19. Being in a position of power is also very dangerous because as we learned, if you're in a position of power and you make a recommendation such as drinking bleach, that actually people will follow through on it, I'll be not many. But the point is when you're a paternalistic authoritative healthcare model where you have experts at the top, you have to be very conservative and very careful with any recommendation you make. For example, many of the drugs and the vaccines that we're using for COVID-19 had to pass large scale randomized controlled trials to justify implementation because obviously if there's any major side effects with that, we have to make sure that the benefit outweighs the risk. So we need very high levels of evidence. High levels of evidence is large randomized controlled trials and even better than that, meta-analysis of these large randomized controlled trials. And so to up, help you understand, conventional is not anti-integrative, it's just simply good science when you have an authoritative model. But integrative is more patient-centered. And the shift is when you're talking to a patient, you don't need those large evidence-based studies to decide what to do to help the patient in front of you. And you can use evidence, evidence-informed medicine to help understand the pros and cons of the treatment and make a team decision approach whether or not you want to do that intervention. And this is what we call evidence-informed medicine. So what is evidence-informed decision-making? It's really simple. Basically, you're just looking at safety versus efficacy. So if you have something like vitamin D, which is well-established to be extremely safe, that's not arguable at this point, but is it efficacious for COVID-19? So we're gonna go over all the data and I'll come back to the slide so we can come up with a conclusion about what we wanna do about vitamin D. So how did I become interested in the vitamin D story? So first um, it's personal. Um, during my fellowship training in oncology, I was noticing unusual fatigue and uh, difficulty staying alert during lectures, which was a new thing for me. Um, some of it might have been related to sleep, but I could tell something different. So I asked a primary care to get a blood test done to check my vitamin D25 level, which I never had checked before. Um, but partly because of this research project that you see in front of you that created an interest in finding out what my level was. And I found out it was 17 nanograms per ml, which is called severely low. So it was shocking to me at the time because I was living in the Sunshine State and uh, my residence was literally on South Beach, uh, Miami. So I found that I was recommended low doses of vitamin D and low doses in retrospect, 1000 international units a day. And my vitamin D levels were not getting back to normal. So it ultimately required 5000 international units a day to get my vitamin D levels above 30. So the other way I got interested in vitamin D was this paper that's sitting here before you. We found that there were improved clinical outcomes associated with vitamin D supplementation during adjuvant chemo in patients with HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, one of the nice things about working in academics is that you have very passionate residents who want to publish. And Dr. Simon Zeichner and I developed a database looking at 300 patients, 308 patients treated at our facility with trastuzumab. The reason why we looked at this particular subset is trastuzumab is a new antibody-based approach to breast cancer treatment. Antibodies work not only by blocking the signaling of the breast cancer, the HER2 signaling in this case, it also induces an immune response against the cancer. So it really was our first type of immunotherapy for breast cancer. So I was interested to see what impact vitamin D would have on this particular treatment strategy. So what we found was 54.5% were taking vitamin D and 60% were taking 20,000 international units a week or less, and 33% had a vitamin D deficiency at the start of treatment. And what we found was that if you were taking vitamin D supplementation during your HER2 targeted therapy, you had a hazard ratio of 0.36 or a much greater than 50% lesser chance of having disease recur in follow-up. And we didn't, weren't able to really follow overall survival because as you know, HER2 positive breast cancer is a very good outcome and we had very low mortality in our series. But here's the actual graph where you can see that particular hazard ratio. What they found was even in multivariate analysis, the only two metrics that determine progression-free survival or relationship to that was vitamin D use and the tumor size after multivariate analysis. And we know that tumor size um, generally is a bad prognostic factor as well. So this discovery and personal discovery uh, really prompted a thorough review of the vitamin D literature. And to help anyone who's interested in reviewing the literature, I put this uh, slide there to help you navigate the literature because it's a tongue twister going through all the vitamin D forms, calciferol, ergo calciferol, 
But generally through this presentation, I'm gonna be using vitamin D2, D, D3. I'm gonna use the D nomenclature, just I find it's less a tongue twister and easier for audience to understand. But the main concept I want you to understand for this audience is that generally vitamin D is a process that depends on the sun. 20% of our vitamin D comes from foods. And that's what you see here with the foods and the mushrooms, cod, mackerel, mushrooms, um, supplements are generally our best source of vitamin D. Even if you only ate mushrooms and mackerel, you would not have enough vitamin D. So really you need the sunshine. 80% of our vitamin D comes from the sunshine. What happens is UV light hits your skin. And if you don't have a lot of melanin, you have very efficient conversion of a pre-vitamin D3, uh, a, a 70 hydro cholesterol to the pre-vitamin D3. This reaction depends on UV light. So the key message here is that if you're an ethnic minority and you have darker pigmentation, you're at much higher risk for vitamin D deficiency because the UV light's being absorbed by melanin. That's point number one. Point number two is there's other vitamin Ds, vitamin D-like compounds that are converted in the skin. And some new research is showing that some of these vitamin D-like compounds are actually more immunostimulatory than just the D3. So I always like to look back at the information and remind people, try to get the sun exposure because it does seem to have some extra benefit. But as you know, vitamin D3 is activated, um, hydroxylated in the liver to 25 vitamin D3. And then it needs another hydroxylation reaction, which takes place in the kidneys or in other parts of the body, even monocytes have this, to, to convert into the active 125 vitamin D3. This is the active vitamin D3 that binds to vitamin D receptor, which then transports it to the nucleus for its biological activity. There's other activities it can do without going to the nucleus, but the point is, this is a steroid. This is not just a vital amine or a vitamin, but it's actually a steroid that regulates over hundreds of genes. So there's a lot of reasons why vitamin D would have impact in broad ranges of indications. And this slide is a lot more detailed and really it's more for the YouTube audience when we put this out on YouTube so you can pause it and really see the rich complexity of vitamin D signaling. But again, the key graphic here is seeing that this vitamin D, when it's activated, it binds to vitamin D receptor and transports to the nucleus and regulates numerous genes. So what are the known factors that influence vitamin D25 levels? Vitamin D25 is currently considered the best proxy for how well you're supplemented with vitamin D. Um, and currently we know that if you, as you age from your teens to the late seventies, your ability to produce pre-vitamin D3 in the skin decreases by about 50%. Ethnic minorities I mentioned earlier have typically lower vitamin D25 levels. We also know that if you have an elevated BMI or obesity, it's associated with a higher risk of vitamin D deficiency. Why is that? Maybe because vitamin D is fat soluble, but also there's another study that showed if you take a diet heavy in fructose, you can lead to an activation of vitamin D via upregulation of an enzyme that 24 hydroxylase that inactivates vitamin D. And it also inactivates or downregulates the enzyme that helps promote active vitamin D3 forms. So in general, Heavy fructose intake, maybe, which is definitely a dietary issue in this country, maybe that's why there's also this low vitamin D level associated with obesity. And this is currently where we're at with COVID-19, which is currently in some newspapers being called a $16 trillion virus based on the impact on the economy to date. We already have over 400,000 dead, unfortunately, from this virus. And again, a lot of it has to do with the misinformation uh, that was perpetuated by politicians and the media. It's unfortunate, but that's the reality of what happened. You might see that there was an uptick there in the last few months. And in fact, there's a few articles saying that there's new strains out that might be more, definitely more transmissible, but possibly more higher mortality. I really question that data because generally they're doing month over month mortality figures. And as you can see from this, that introduces a lot of confounding factors. This graph shows typically what happens to your vitamin D over the course of the year. Typically vitamin D plummets during October. And then you can see that it reaches a nadir during the January to March years. And that's when you see the peak mortality rates with flu. And so it wouldn't be surprising if we see a similar pattern with coronavirus during this winter. But it's important to note that right now we're having this webinar in February and that's on purpose. We wanted to make sure we got this message out during a time when people are most vulnerable. This is a map that was in a letter to the editor showing the hotspots for COVID-19 mortality in this world. 
and relationship to their location on the map. And you can see here that generally at the 35th parallel, which is right here, the 35th parallel, above north of that, you see the hot spots are generally north of that line. You can see in the United States, generally that runs through the southern part of this country, but the majority of the US is above that parallel. And you can see there are very relatively fewer hot spots in the equator, and then another surge of cases as you go below the equator. This is another visual or graph that was published in Journal of Internal Medicine this year that also shows the same picture, that as you move further north up in latitude, you start to see a general trend to higher mortality. The thing that's not shown on this graph that I want to highlight is that you're not seeing two of the most northern European countries on this map, on this graph, Finland and Norway. And if you can try to guess why that might be, the answer is that these are the two countries that have already have a national strategy for fixing vitamin D deficiency. So generally you have a very low vitamin D deficiency incidence there. And interestingly, they are not part of those higher incidence of mortality in the northern climates. And this is just another graphic illustrating the same that shows, again, a trend as you have higher vitamin D levels, you tend to have lower mortality with COVID-19. So the Bradford Hill criteria was created by Bradford Hill because epidemiological data and trying to find out what's toxic to the human body is a difficult task because you can't randomize patients to intentionally get COVID-19. So what you have to do is use either randomized control studies, or you can use Bradford Hill criteria to understand the truth of the situation. So we already know nine of these aspects, two of them are clearly satisfied for this vitamin D and COVID-19. One is temporality, the vitamin D deficiency already existed before this COVID-19 started. And then also the map of COVID-19 high mortality fits the demographics of where you would expect UV light to be seen. Now, the next study I wanted to focus on was this meta-analysis of vitamin D supplementation to prevent acute respiratory tract infection. While this is not focusing on COVID-19, it is focusing on a very similar issue. And this is a very large meta-analysis of over 11,000 subjects and 25 studies. And they found that vitamin D supplementation reduced the risk of acute respiratory tract infection with an adjusted odds ratio of 0.88. Now, granted, that's not a huge effect size, but the key points from this study, no adverse events were greater than placebo or control. And in the subgroup analysis, we found that those with low vitamin D25 levels were benefited the most. So bolus dosing versus weekly or daily was associated with no benefit. And Further analysis confounding that it, despite a large patients with low vitamin D, they just gave it to normal or untested patients. I'm gonna pause because my internet connection is unstable at the moment. Okay, it's better. And that, uh, sorry, I was missing my train of thought. So the vitamin D will not only help, you really should focus these studies in the future on patients with low vitamin D levels, a lot of the studies um, focus on way too low dosing of vitamin D. No one would be using those doses to address deficiency today if they know what they're doing. And so really, despite all that noise, the meta-analysis still showed significant effect. So we have an experiment where meta-analysis is already shown to reduce risk of respiratory infection despite the incredible noise of inadequate vitamin D dosing and lack of focus on patients who had low vitamin D levels. And this is a similar study we're looking at 9,940 patients, um, but what they did was they divided tiers. Unlike the other study, they divided vitamin D deficiency by tiers. So you had in red, severely deficient, in yellow or orange, um, insufficient, and in green, normal. And so 15 years of follow-up for this prospective registry and a total of 24.7% had died. The reason why I wanted to focus on this study, even though it's not focused on COVID, is it shows a gradient, a biological gradient, that if you're severely deficient, you're much more likely to die from respiratory illness in the next 15 years versus those who are just insufficient versus those who are normal. And so this shows that there's a biological gradient, that the degree of deficiency of vitamin D magnifies the impact of the supplementation. And again, prior pneumonia mortality rates fit that vitamin D seems to have a role in respiratory infection. Next slide shows a study that I thought was really nicely done from Quest Diagnostics. Kaufman looked at over 191,000 patients from 50 states, 9.3% tested COVID-19 positive. The good thing about this study, and this is not common for all the vitamin D COVID studies, 
is that they specified the vitamin D result was all within a year prior to them being COVID-19 positive. 12.5% were vitamin D deficient, less than 20 nanograms per ml, and they found that their inverse, inverse correlation remained significant in multivariate logistic models, meaning that other confounders were not the reason for this um, trend. They also found, again, that black and non-Hispanic zip codes, Hispanic zip codes were more likely to be tested positive. And here you can see the curve, whereas your vitamin D25 drops, you get a much higher chance of positivity. In fact, when you're sufficient versus high, you have almost a 50% drop in likelihood of being positive. In this subset analysis, he looked at, and again, showed northern latitudes. Those who get less UV light exposure had a much higher chance of being positive. And again, unfortunately, Black, non-Hispanic, and Hispanics, and, and other studies, American Indians, Asians um, as well, um, are at higher risk of testing positive. In this study, um, this is a group, Meltzer in Chicago, um, looked at a single academic institution cohort who had a vitamin D level test, again, available within a, within a year prior to their test for COVID-19. And uh, they defined deficiency as less than 20 and 35% were deficient, which gave a relative risk of 1.77, which was statistically significant. So in other words, these patients that were low on vitamin D were 1.7 or 1.8 times more likely to be COVID-19 positive. And the vitamin D, this in this study, which also looked at specific outcomes in the ICU, in the hospital, gives us a little more interest into the mortality risk of vitamin D. So this is a prospective registry that was done in a hospital uh, group, of, in a hospital, single hospital in Germany. And uh, they had samples available to retrospectively test. So they found that 64% of those admitted with COVID-19 were low on vitamin D, less than 20, and severely low in 22%, meaning less than 12 nanograms per ml. So they had a median follow-up of two months. And what you see on this graph here is in, in red is, are those patients who had low vitamin D, less than 12, and those who had normal vitamin D, 25 levels. In gray, graph A, this is intubation. So your chance of being intubation was 7.6 fold higher if you had a low vitamin D, severely low vitamin D, and this is mortality, you were 18 fold higher likely, li likely to die from COVID-19 if your vitamin D was less than 12 versus those who are normal. And in this graph, you have the same thing, but now it's more limited to the subset of inpatients versus outpatient observation patients, but it's very similar curves. And in this graph, you see the same analysis, um, same subsets, but now looking at vitamin D between 20 and normal. And you still see separation of the curves, but just not as severe. So again, you're seeing a biological gradient. The degree of deficiency magnifies the impact of COVID-19, not just for intubation, but actual mortality. The next study was done in Israel, which looked at 14,000 patients who tested for COVID-19. 10.1% had a positive test. They excluded those who had no pre previous vitamin D levels. And they found that if you're severely low, less than 20, your odds ratio was 1.6. You're 1.6 fold higher likely to be testing positive for COVID-19. It was still statistically significant for insufficient levels, 20 to 29, but not as statistically significant. Lastly, I wanna go over this meta-analysis, which shows that these are all the publications that have been published looking at COVID positivity and vitamin D levels. I didn't wanna go over all of them because some of these are not as good quality, but in summary, there were four studies that showed an association between vitamin D deficiency and risk of COVID-19 infection with an odds ratio of 1.43. So um, even with meta-analysis, um, we already see that there's a significant correlation. So I just wanted to mention that because some people say, why didn't you include some other studies? But I do wanna mention that two of these studies here that I did not want to review um, come from the UK. Although they're large ends, they used the UK Biobank, which was a database from 2016, I'm sorry, 2006 to 2010 to study the impact of COVID-19 in 2020. Vitamin D levels are very easy to measure today. And really we don't have any place for confusing the vitamin D study and role, role of vitamin D and immunity using vitamin D levels from 10 years ago. So that's really the reason probably why there's just way too much noise. If you're gonna check a vitamin D level, usually the point is to replace it. So um, this is, these were very flawed studies that I'm not including here because I really don't feel those are good quality studies for what we're asking here. But seven studies did look at COVID-19 positive and negative cohorts. And generally there was also a trend 
to lower vitamin D status in these studies, but it wasn't as solid as those that just focused on COVID-19 positive PCR tests. And I think there's a reason for that. Um, generally, if you're looking at COVID-19 negative cohorts, you're talking about patients that were actually sick and that qualify for testing. So you're not getting necessarily a healthy cohort there. So that might be where there's more noise and less significance. So if you limit analysis to studies that methods clearly use vitamin 25 levels from the previous year, you're gonna have consistent results. And that's very powerful. I'm only mentioning this study because it's the largest database. It's 17 million patients in England. And there were, what it is, I wanted to use this to highlight the epidemiology of factors for getting COVID-19. And again, this is very similar in many other studies, but in this study, again, it shows if you're above age 80, that's the biggest risk factor. And we know vitamin D drops by 50% production in the skin in these patients, and they're more likely to be indwelling or in a nursing home. Um, also, we know obesity is a risk factor. We know obesity, as I mentioned earlier, is a risk factor for vitamin D deficiency, but less an impact than age. Um, we also know ethnicity is a risk factor and all the ethnic ethnicities were at higher risk and this probably has to do with pigmentation. Unless we think being a minority gives you a gene, a universal gene that puts you in more susceptibility for it. So, and diabetes also is associated with higher risk factors for vitamin D deficiency also was significant in this analysis. So when you're looking for an association, you wanna see that the patient population that would be most at risk for vitamin D deficiency are the ones that are most at risk from COVID-19. And so we see that type of specificity, but I'm not implying that that alone is a reason to say vitamin D is the cause, but again, it's one of nine criteria here and it's one of the nine that's satisfied. So now I'm gonna begin discussion on randomized control studies as we hit the 25 minute mark and talk about these because these are very profound. I had doubts, honestly, about whether vitamin D supplementation would really have an impact on patients that are already admitted and sick with COVID-19. So I really looked at these studies with great interest. This is a Spanish study, which looked at calcifediol. And if you were paying attention with the legend and the key slide, calcifediol is vitamin D25. So it's not D3. D3 has to activate through the liver and the kidneys or through the monocytes or the alveolar coating cells in the lung. But Calcifediol D25 skips the liver metabolism and can be directly activated in the alveolar coating cells of the lungs. So the investigators wanted to use calcifediol, not D3, to see if this would have an impact on patients already hospitalized with COVID-19. They did not have baseline serum vitamin D levels, but all patients were randomized to either hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and vitamin D or calcifediol or not, but all patients got hydroxychloroquine azithromycin as a protocol, but two to one randomization on whether or not they got this calcifediol or vitamin D25. The key point is that the patients who did not, did not get placebo and they were not blinded. So this creates a bias. And I think it's important to mention because obviously you're gonna look at this data and say, well, gosh, this, has, this is amazing data. We should just do this for everyone. But when you have a non-blinded, non-placebo trial, the patient knows they're getting the vitamin D, the investigator knows they're getting the vitamin D. When you're talking about ICU admissions, ICU admissions sometimes is a subjective call. Did the investigator knowing the patient was on vitamin D feel more comfortable about their clinical status? Um, did the patient underestimate their symptoms because they wanted to make their investigator happy? That's a known phenomena. So there is some bias in the study, but the results are pretty powerful. ICU admissions, there were only one of 50 in the vitamin D group that was admitted to the ICU, but 13 of 26 in the ones who got nothing, just the azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine or 50% of the patients were admitted to the ICU. And this was very statistically significant. Also, you had univariate odds, a ratio of 0 0.02 and multivariate odds saying that even with all the other confounding factors that we know affect ICU mortality, these were still very significant. Deaths, um, we had no deaths in the treatment group, but meanwhile, two out of 26 died in the non-treatment group and two of 13 that were admitted to the ICU were the ones that died. So very compelling data. So interesting thing is that this study is gonna be followed up with a much larger study. The report is that's gonna have over a thousand patients. And so this is study is gonna be followed up on to, because they are very provocative. This is another study looking at short-term high dose vitamin D3 supplementation uh, for COVID-19 disease. It was called the SHADE study. And I thought this was a really well-designed study. What they did was they focused on patients who were pre-tested to be vitamin D deficient. That's a very strong design. 
and they gave very good high levels of vitamin D3 that reasonably could increase their vitamin G25 levels while they're hospitalized. And so this is a very interesting study, especially if you're curious to find out how fast can you increase these vitamin D levels for hospitalized patients. So what they did was they ruled out patients who had severe COVID-19. And what they're doing is they're looking at patients who had mild or asymptomatic illness, and they wanted to find out at the three week time point, what were their, would they test as a negative PCR for COVID-19? And so what they found was they gave patients 60,000 units of D3 in a five ml oral solution per day for seven straight days with the aim to achieve a level of 50, greater than 50 nanograms per ml uh, levels. So that's a pretty good level. On day seven, they found that if your vitamin D25 was greater than 50, then they would just go to 60,000 units a week for maintenance, or if they did not reach that target, they would do it for another week. So 40 of 89 screen patients were eligible and 16 were randomized to the intervention. And again, the primary outcome was portions of patients who turned COVID-19 negative before week three. They also looked at inflammatory markers. And you can see here that the inflammatory marker fibrinogen, which is very sensitive for inflammation, was markedly less in those who got the intervention, the vitamin D. And you see that the vitamin D levels, um, understandably, were much better in the intervention group. But what they found was 10 of the 16 patients who were in the intervention did achieve a, greater, a level greater than 50 by day seven, and two of the six were hit the uh, target by day 14. So it's a nice validation that this kind of dosing schema can actually make a significant impact within a week or two. And again, there were no side effects, no hypercalcemia, no adverse um, vessels like kidney stones. The primary outcome uh, was 10 out of 16 in the vitamin D group became PCR negative or 62.5% versus only 20.8% in the control group. And this was statistically significant. The last randomized control study I'll go over is for preprint. I promise not to do this, but since it was a negative study, I wanted to be fair and also talk about why it might have been negative. This was a patient where this was a study where 240 hospitalized patients at two Brazilian hospitals with severe COVID-19 only got only a single dose of 200,000 units of D3. So it's a one unit bullets dosing. As you remember from the meta-analysis study, we learned that single oral dosing really is not that effective. But the primary outcome was length of hospital stay um, as hospital discharge from date of randomization or death. Secondary outcomes were mortality and mission ICU. But in short, it was a negative study, um, but it was not yet peer reviewed. Um, Meta-analysis have identified that bullet dosing is not as effective. So, and these patients also, I believe after peer review, I'm, we're probably gonna find that they were not pre-selected for vitamin D deficiency, which obviously is gonna hurt the impact as well. But it's not yet peer reviewed, so I really can't go into too much at this point. And this other study is looking at vitamin D levels in asymptomatic and critically ill patients. And it was a prospective observational study, which is better than retrospective to reduce bias. And it was a six week India study. And what they found was COVID-19 patients aged between 30 to 60 were admitted at a tertiary COVID-19 center. And they separated the groups into two groups. Group A was PCR confirmed COVID-19, but asymptomatic at the time of admission and re remained asymptomatic by the 12th day. And they found these patients generally had a mean 25 vitamin D level of 28 nanograms per ml, which is very close to normal. Group B are the patients who needed ICU admission due to severe COVID-19 disease. And these were 63 patients and their mean level was half the level of those who were asymptomatic or on the floor. Of no, 21 were died, but only one of the 21 was from group A. So again, criticism was that there were poor descriptors of the patient comorbidities, but again, further evidence showing this biological gradient. So again, this is highlighting in other ways, the mortality data, um, but in the interest of time, I'll go on. So we really have strong association. Um, sometimes with epidemiological data, we don't have the benefit of having really good randomized clinical trials, but I would say the strength of association is pretty powerful here. You have, even in the situations where I doubted it could have an impact in randomized controlled studies, it had a very big effect size with strong high dose vitamin D3 or calcifediol, which is 25D, a more activated, if you will, form of vitamin D that requires less activation in the body. So for the other two points of the Branford Hill criteria, 
I just want to emphasize um, for analogy, this is an easy one and boring for the audience. I didn't want to mention it early, but dexamethasone. Dexamethasone has already been shown in randomized controlled studies to have an impact on mortality for COVID-19, albeit modest, in the recovery study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And just like vitamin D, dexamethasone is a steroid. And so the concept of a steroid having an impact on mortality is not foreign. It's already established. So the analogy is already there. And then coherence is really where it gets ridiculous. As an investigator, as a researcher, as a clinical practitioner who's been fixing vitamin D for now 10 plus years as a standard of care for patients with breast cancer, because the evidence suggests it's probably a 30% risk reduction in breast cancer if you replete it. And we know that women who are African-American who have low vitamin D levels are particularly at increased risk of the most immune sensitive breast cancer and most aggressive triple negative breast cancer. In fact, there was a study that showed a remarkable biological gradient as you went higher in vitamin D, that risk of triple negative breast cancer steadily went down. So it fits clinical experience. I've had amazing stories where patients, we fix their vitamin D before we start chemotherapy and surgery and radiation. At the end of radiation, they're elated because they have less foggy brain than they did before they started treatment. That's pretty powerful. Um, we also have some great examples from our center because we're replacing vitamin D as a normal standard of care. I can now tell you four samples, four examples where the patient whose vitamin D we repleted ended up being the only person in our household that did not get COVID-19. We're talking about the husband, all the children, relatives were getting it, except the person that we fixed her vitamin D. We have four examples of this, where repeated testing for PCR, all negative, serologies were negative. So I will probably pr produce that as a case series. But again, these are all anecdotes and some of the anecdote is not true evidence, but when you're taking care of patients, you get valuable insights. And when patients are telling you that they're feeling better and they're having better quality of life than before even starting their treatment for breast cancer, you need to listen. And again, we know that Finland, Norway has the lowest mortality despite being one of the most northerly countries in Europe. We know vitamin D is directly active against skin TB, another respiratory infection, partly because vitamin D is directly activated and in the monocytes where TB likes to hide. And vitamin D receptor polymorphisms has a direct relationship to risk of hospitalization with RSV bronchiolitis. So how much evidence do you need, is the question, to replace a vital amine, a vi an essential vitamin in the human body that we cannot get enough of if we live in the northerly climates? I would actually reverse this whole thing and say, we don't need the Bradford Hill criteria. We need Bradford Hill criteria to prove that you don't need to fix the vitamin D because really common sense tells us that you should do it. And the evidence is so extraordinary. I'm just going over the evidence for COVID-19. I haven't even, I don't have hours to go over the evidence for cancer and other conditions. So what do you do for the patient who's talking to you? What do you do for the webinar audience that's listening to this today? Is vitamin D safe? I wanna show you this slide. With, this is vitamin D levels going up to 20,000 units a day, um, which some people will have panic attacks if they see their patients on. But this is a nanogram. Keep in mind the dosing here is nanomoles per liter. So you have to divide these numbers by two and a half. But generally what you're taking from this slide is that you really have to push hard to get patients above 100 nanograms per ml. Generally, uh, most people say try to avoid getting above 100 because the risk of kidney stones does start to go up. And I have seen a case with a kidney stone at 125. So that is something to be cautious about. Generally, if you're low BMI, you're more likely to overshoot. But the point here being is that you, you need a lot of dosing. And if you have a patient who's very overweight, don't be surprised if you need a much bigger dose than what you're used to hearing. This is a slide that breaks down your vitamin D dose relationship to serum levels. And you can see that the more overweight and obese you are, which are these lower curves, the more difficult you're gonna have pushing these levels up to 50. So I actually have a lot of patients in my clinic who might be obese, an African-American and are not absorbing vitamin D well that need 15,000 units. This is not unusual. And this is another slide to illustrate the safety of vitamin D. Um, a lot of times I hear from other providers who criticize me for putting patients on high dose vitamin D, saying that you're putting my patient at risk for hypercalcemia, I don't want that, and they put them back on a lower dose. Look at this slide. I mean, these are patients that are getting doses up to 20,000 units a day. The calcium levels are not trending up with vitamin D supplementation. 
I have looked at case reports in the literature. There's always another plausible explanation. I've never personally seen a case where hypercalcium was induced only by vitamin D and there wasn't an other plausible explanation. I think there maybe might be a few cases where it does happen in high-risk patients, like patients maybe with dialysis or other non-functioning organs, but really vitamin D is very safe on calcium. And if you see elevated calcium, think about the other things in the differential. And also this slide is just a reminder, remember vitamin D, the last thing vitamin D is a static variable. That's why I really shun any study that's looking at a vitamin D level over 10 years before the toxic exposure. And this is why, because vitamin D levels change, vitamin D levels are checked. And when you know them, patients are inclined to self-advocate and get that replaced. So I wanted to cut to the main point of the slide and the conclusion. So what are my recommendations? This isn't a re recommendation from CTC or SIO, but what am I doing in my clinical practice? What do I recommend for those who are attending this webinar? I would highly recommend that you identify a doctor or provider who's willing to obtain a vitamin D25 level for you and hopefully has experience and comfort with vitamin D replacement. If you're having trouble finding that primary care doctor, do include naturopaths on your list. They have a long history of replacing vitamin D and to naturopaths, we have a large debt of gratitude for clinical experience replacing this. But um, find a provider who's willing to work with you so you can use biofeedback or the actual level to let you know if you're achieving the goal. It's very difficult to give a blanket recommendation. And this is why the national or the global recommendations are very low levels of daily dietary intake. For example, 400 international units in one recommendation, up to 1,000 another. They're very conservative because these are global recommendations and they have to make a recommendation that's safe, that less than one to 3% are not going, less than one to 3% would suffer side effects if they follow that advice. So by nature, it has to be very conservative. In the old days, when those recommendations were made, vitamin D was a very hard test to get even more so an accurate vitamin D test. So you could actually get these tests and be fooled into getting completely incorrect levels. But in today's era, the availability of good standard vitamin D testing is much more prevalent. I don't think we need to make this a mystery or a fear thing. Let's check vitamin D levels and help patients get to the level they want to be. So generally, if you test less than 30 nanograms per ml and you're insufficient, I think it's a no brainer. You should replace with vitamin D. If your BMI is very low, keep in mind you're going to be very sensitive to the D3 supplement. So you might want to start on the lower side, especially if you're very close to 30. But generally, I find that a range between 1,000 and 5,000 will get you to my preferred zone, which is 50. If you're worried about side effects, I would say then go for 50. That's the ultra conservative side. But there are some studies saying that if you go higher than 50, there might be some downsides as far as bone metabolism. There's a study that actually osteoporosis would not necessarily benefit if you push beyond 50. So the key with high doses, and if you're gonna do any of these doses that I'm listing here, is to get a follow-up routine lab test. So I'm not recommending that you take any of these doses willy-nilly on your own. You need to get the confirmatory testing to do it safely. And if you can't get the confirmatory testing, you really need to do the daily recommendations, which is the ultra safe recommendation. But in today's day and era, you don't have to be so ultra conservative. And also account for all the information slides that I shared that account for seasonality, how much time you spend outdoors, where you're located geographically. Some people get surprised that their vitamin D shoots up when they move from Chicago to New Mexico. Fructose intake could be important, BMI, skin pigmentation, and how much fortified foods you're taking. So if you move to Finland, you might wanna drop your vitamin D supplementation. So again, this is to highlight why you got so many conservative recommendations for daily dietary intake. And whereas if you see an integrated provider, you're seeing someone who's very more proactive and aggressive about wanting to actually get those levels up in a very aggressive fashion. And because I'm an oncologist, I'm seeing my patients every three weeks if they're doing chemo or seeing them every three months if they're more routine follow-up, we have the luxury of checking vitamin D. This is not a mystery. And when you talk to the patients, and this is why integrative is so important, their subjective experience is critical to the healing process. If they're telling you that their foggy brain is better than it was before chemo, that's really important information you need to know as a clinician, and it should trigger these kind of investigative questions that I went through. So now here's the next question that maybe other people are asking, what do we do if you actually have a COVID-19 confirmed illness? So again, these are not CTC or SIO recommendations, but this is what I would recommend if I was talking to in the clinic or on the phone. Again, it's still too early to make any general recommendation for the treatment of COVID-19 illness. But I think a reasonable recommendation is 
check the vitamin D25 level. And if you're low, I think it's reasonable to go ahead and focus on trying to boost that to normal levels. The question is, is aggressive hypervitamin D supplementation really indicated? Certainly we have a randomized controlled study saying that that did help patients avoid ICU admission and stay asymptomatic, but that was just one study and it had some flaws. So, but generally because of the safety of it, I would say, Certainly, if you're checking vitamin D levels, if I was an intensive care person, I might consider vitamin D. And certainly, if you looked at Donald Trump's regimen when he was hospitalized, he got vitamin D and zinc. So integrative care is not foreign to our presence. Um, the other question that I would raise as really unknown but very interesting questions is if you're... Um, would, would using vitamin D25 be better than D3? We don't know that question, but the Spanish studies certainly bring that up. Definitely don't do it as a large time bolus. We already know from the meta-analysis that's not a good strategy. Um, but also um, we needed more studies. Um, but really my hope is that more of the vitamin D studies will focus on those with deficiency and measure specific outcomes that are not prone to bias, such as mortality or um, mortality discharge, clearance to PCR or inflammatory markers. Um, another thing that we know is that there's some patients out there that are dealing with chronic complications and disabilities with COVID-19. So it might be worthwhile to focus on those subsets, study vitamin D and vitamin D replenishment, replenishment to see if that would help address those, if those chronic symptoms and disabilities are due to inadequate vitamin D, It'd be a very interesting hypothesis. But right now, again, there's really no, not enough evidence to make a hard recommendation, but certainly I would welcome um, any of you to work with an integrative practitioner. And I think you'll find as long as you're following the vitamin D levels, you'll have generally a very safe process. So with that, I just wanna conclude, say thank you for attending this webinar. I wanna make sure we had 15 minutes for Q and A, so I think we're on time. And just wanted again say, please uh, check out our new website. We just had the website redesigned. It's www.integrativeonc. Dot org. Follow us on Twitter. We share recent, recent information, blogs, podcasts, integrative oncology talks with, leading, uh, with leaders in the integrative oncology field, just really lots of good content. And that's really the focus of our organization now is not only promoting research, but really having an extra effort and really promoting and empowering um, patients and the public with scientific information so you can make the decision what's best for your health not let an authority decide if they need to tell you that or share that information with you. So again, thank you for attention. Just to let you know, the video of this webinar will be shared on YouTube. So we'd love it if you share it with your friends and family, if you found this was helpful and just get the word out because I really do feel that this is gonna save lives if people take heed of this advice um, in February, 2021. So thank you again for your attention and I'll go to the questions. So I'm going to the Q and A panel. So first question was, do women average more vitamin D levels than males? I saw the gender mention in addition to race. It's a very good question. Um, generally, uh, it depends on ethnicity, um, keep in mind ethnicity and culture. So um, it's not as simple as just pure biology, but um, the male, it's a, I'm not quite sure why, ma why males are more prone to it, but it might have more to do with the lung physiology, smoking risk and all those other things. But I'm not aware of, um, there's a specific reason why vitamin D uh, would impact this male-female difference that we're seeing in the epidemiological studies. So I don't have a good answer for that. Um, the next question is, did any studies look at incidence of arrhythmias or AFib with such high dose interventions? High dose D is associated with cardiac arrhythmias. Um, that's a good question. I'm not aware of the studies that showed cardiac arrhythmias with high dose interventions. Um, so, uh, I don't, and definitely I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at specifically arrhythmias. Um, we did, you know, there are studies that looked at vitamin D that did track cardiac events and outcomes and side effects. So a lot of studies have, that did have good study design did not report arrhythmias. So I guess the, the other question I would be asking about that is were the arrhythmias related to their acute illness and the reason why they're trying to do the high dose intervention. If they were really healthy subjects, then definitely that's a specific side effect then we should probably look for in future vitamin D studies. So I'm glad you brought that up as a question, but, uh, um, but that's a very good question, but something that requires more further follow-up. Another question said, what does Finland and Norway do for their populations to address vitamin D? And it's getting cut off here. 
vitamin D proactively? Good question. So I'm not a Finland Norway expert, so I didn't have time to really go into their policies. My understanding is they actually provide vitamin D for supplementation for free. And uh, Graham actually has some personal input on this. So I'd like uh, Graham, uh, who's my support here too, maybe has some personal experience having maybe been there. So Graham, go ahead and chime in. Well, I, I think maybe Graham would just like to answer, maybe would let me to answer this question. So maybe he doesn't want to answer it, but certainly if someone lives here in Finland or Norway, I'd love to hear your input, but, but they do provide, I believe, I'm not not sure if it's both countries, but they provide vitamin D for free. In fact, it's a very good question because there's actually a lot of publications and a lot of scientists that are advocating that we essentially do that, that we just provide, how much does vitamin D 5,000 units a day cost for one person? Essentially it's 10 bucks if you're mass producing and providing it for free. That's a super cheap and looking at the data, super cost-effective and very safe way to reduce risk for COVID-19 mortality in this country. I am with those, all those other scientists that have published these recommendations. I think the evidence is too provocative. I think what you have to do is you have to go back to that slide where you see the sunshine impacting our skin, hitting UV light, creating a chemistry reaction that causes vitamin D to then cause biological reactions in our body. Since we're talking about the natural benefits of vitamin D, I want the audience to know that vitamin D receptor evolved way before humans became in a being. They evolved actually in lamprey. This is the early study where they found it was evolved over 550 million years ago. So these were in invertebrate, and so these were invertebrates that didn't require hard skeletons. And really the calcium homeostasis that the vitamin D receptor was regulating at that time was more to help regulate fuel for the immune system to fight off respiratory infection. So evolutionary wise, vitamin D actually receptor evolved as a mechanism to make sure that animals were less infection prone. It was only after vertebrates moved to land and needed skeletons that we really had more of the bone metabolism features that we're seeing now. So again, when we look at the way vitamin D receptor and vitamin D functions in the blood, the fact it's expressed in monocytes and other immune cells, it has many immune regulatory effects. They look at the DNA, the genes that are upregulated just in the monocyte are over a hundred different genes. And so, to actually start sitting here and needing a one hour lecture to convince the world that we need to fix vitamin D is a little bit of a dysfunction. Um, we really should be looking at is why are we needing so much evidence? How did we get into a culture that started doubting the evolutionary processes in our own body? And to me, that's really a fascinating subject and really reflects our culture. Next question was, it can be difficult to get frequent vitamin D levels covered by insurance even when documented deficiency. Do you have any suggestions for diagnosis we can use so we can get coverage when using vitamin D, for example, breast cancer in younger women who are not osteopenic yet? Very good question. Um, so I'm a breast cancer specialist, so thank you for sharing this with me. I have never had an issue with vitamin D not getting covered in my practice because I'm always seeing patients with breast cancer, anti-hormonal therapy, um, more than 50% now currently get the anastrozole, the arimidex, which is an aromatase inhibitor, or letrozole, the other one in that same category, these reduce bone strength. So we know vitamin D is a very good supplement for preventing vitamin D um, related osteoporosis when you're deficient. So I never have issues getting it covered. So if you're having difficulty getting it covered, um, you know, definitely getting a diagnosis code that it could be related to would probably help you. And so it might just be a coding issue on the part of your doctor. So um, try to connect it to a diagnosis that's already on your list. So if you have frequent respiratory infections or you have asthma and you, uh, you get frequent infections, that might be a good code to include with a vitamin D order test. So it might be just coding is my suspicion if it's not getting covered, but Vitamin D, um, there is some pushback I hear from primary care about how frequently you can get it. So I think it's good to note that um, you don't have to check it as frequently. If you're doing one of those lower doses, just as maintenance to bring it up to 50, like 1,000 or 5,000, generally I'm finding it's very safe to check a level like three months later. You don't have to do it every week like they did in the ICU study. So you don't have to do the vitamin D as frequently as maybe some are checking, but I do check it about once every three months when I'm starting a patient on vitamin D to make sure they don't overshoot. And maybe that three month intervals kosher with insurance, but that, that's my advice for that question. The next question is since vitamin D has an impact on immune system regulation, are there any concerns about overstimulating immune systems in COVID-19 with high vitamin D doses and contributing or possibly promoting cytokine storm? 
That's a question. Um, but really, you got to remember, vitamin D is not really an immune stimulatory um, hormone. It's really an immunomodulatory um, hormone. So it's not like if you take vitamin D, you're going to get cancer to disappear. It's not like if you get vitamin D, your infection is going to disappear. But it's modifying genes in the immune system, in the respiratory epithelium, that apparently make it more conducive to healing. And you saw the randomized controlled trials, although one was biased and the other one had some flaws, they both were very positive studies with very large effect size that actually clearance to negative PCR was much faster, was, was much higher efficiency within three weeks versus those who didn't get vitamin D. And you had that other randomized controlled study that showed even supplementation of vitamin D25 resulted in a difference in mortality and ICU admission, intubation, and all those other cofactors. So usually intubation is a reflection of the fibrosis, the pulmonary fibrosis, the cytokine, cytokine storm that you're talking about. So if you're having studies that show actually you're minimizing the cytokine storm, and remember I showed you a study, I didn't show all the studies, but a lot of these studies showed inflammatory cytokines as a secondary endpoint. And although not all the second cytokines usually would change, ferritin, which is usually the most sensitive in my experience, um, and usually that's going to be much better in those who are getting vitamin D. So really that tells you that um, really the cytokine storm is more blunted in those who get replaced with vitamin D from those trials. And we're seeing less of the cytokine storm, less risk of intubation, less risk of death. So certainly that was a theoretical concern. And that's why we have to look at the randomized controlled trials. But the randomized control, controlled trials are really saying the opposite. Next question is, are we seeing increased COVID-19 rates among CKD patients? Good question. I'm not a dialysis, uh, chronic kidney disease is what I'm assuming that initial represents. I'm not a dialysis or a nephrologist, so I really haven't looked at the literature for, um, but I would definitely um, think that if you're on dialysis, that would increase your risk. Um, we know that end organ dysfunction does increase your risk of COVID-19, but specifically just an elevated creatinine, uh, I'm not as familiar on the literature on that. So I'll have to recommend uh, someone else to answer that question. And next question is, would vitamin D3 supplementation affect thyroid hormones or synthetic thyroid supplementation, i.e. Synthroid? Could thyroid problems adversely affect vitamin D mechanisms? Good question. I'm not aware of any direct relationship, um, but thyroid hormones and vitamin D have pluripotential effects. So certainly we know from experience that if you have thyroid issues, it makes endocrine therapy much more challenging. So certainly there's gotta be overlap, but you know, the reality is, our studies on vitamin D are really not very mechanistic as they can be. So I'm excited about the future when we really get the scientific excitement about this, these findings and look into the mechanism. I think we're gonna find that vitamin D supplementation will have some issues in certain subtypes, subsets of patients. And we need to know that. That's why we need research. Next question, is there evidence that vitamin K supports increasing vitamin D levels? Yes, it does help absorption and sometimes we'll recommend both to help with that. And another question is, what's a good level for African-American women to maintain vitamin D levels and how would we get vitamin D25? <laughs> good question. Vitamin D25 is not easy to get, so I don't have a way for you to get it. I wouldn't recommend taking it at this point because there isn't a lot of safety data with vitamin D25. Um, so it's really um, just not very evidence-based. I really only do that um, under a direction from a doctor. You should be taking that at home. But for an African-American woman for D3, we can go back to that slide that I shared. I'll really go back to that slide. You know, if you have a high BMI and you're African-American, um, if you're above 30 BMI, then I probably would start 5,000 if you're conservative, but you're probably okay starting at 10,000. As long as you're checking a vitamin D level afterwards, that's the key. I just don't want anyone leaving this webinar taking high doses, anything above 5,000 without checking a follow-up vitamin D level. And the person who's asking this question is a patient of mine, so um, he knows and she knows that we will check the level for it at her request. Um, a few more questions. Do we have any sense of how vitamin D levels may affect immune protection in those who have either had infections or been vaccinated already? Great question. Um, I thought this might come up, so thank you for asking that question. Um, yeah, there's really no evidence since the vaccines just started rolling out. The big question is how effective is vitamin D if you've already been vaccinated. I, we know that there's data that vitamin D deficiency mutes your benefit from the vaccine, but the question is if you address it after the vaccination, is that gonna improve the vaccine effect? I don't know. And there's certainly questions to suggest maybe it wouldn't, but um, 
So if you've already been vaccinated, I don't know if it'll boost the vaccination. We don't have any data for that, but certainly it will still have all the other benefits um, that we're talking about before. Maybe it's more muted because of the vaccination for COVID in terms of COVID-19 specific outcomes, but still you're getting the benefit for other respiratory infections and the other benefits as well. Um, if you had the infection already, I think that's another good question. I mentioned uh, at the end of my slide that I think one really important question is how do we help those who are dealing with chronic complications for COVID-19? Some are still positive for COVID-19 and actually very provocative data from science showing that these patients are actually having ongoing mutations in their SARS virus so that the spike receptors changing so that it's less immunogenic to the immune system to remain there in the body. So how do you overcome that? Um, it might not be vaccines that help those patients, maybe boosting their vitamin D. So it's a really important question, um, but we just don't have the uh, evidence or research done yet today. So thank you for all those great questions. So any other questions, uh, Morgan, that I missed? No, I think that was all. Okay, again, thank you for your attention and wishing you well and hope 2021 is a healthy uh, year and a, a year of positive change for us all. So well wishes.